I think it's a really interesting story how our museum started. So Jack and I were married 31 years ago, I almost said 30, and we honeymooned in Prince Edward Island. And after he had read for himself Anna Green Gables in PEI, and we'd seen all the sites, we came back to Bala and saw this poor bedraggled house that was for sale and had seen inside. We also checked the local registry office to see who owned it. And it turned out that this lady, Mrs. Fanny Pike, and her husband Charles Pike owned this house and it was called a tourist home. Now tourist home, homes were something like a, a B and B, except that you could board or you could just come in for meals or you could stay overnight. So in the summer of 1922, a woman named Lucy Maud McDonald or Mrs. Ewan McDonald, came with her husband and two little boys for a holiday in Bala, a two week holiday. And they stayed up just up the street at a place called Roselawn Lodge, which unfortunately has burnt down. So during that time, they discovered that there was no cook at Roselawn Lodge. So Maud approached Mrs. Fanny Pike and asked if they could have meals here, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for two weeks. And Mrs. Pike said yes, not knowing she had Canada's most famous author right here in this house, the author of Anna Green Gables. Now we have found a few things from that era. And if you just swing over here, there's a sign that says overnight guests. So that was one of the signs that hung outside this house um, saying that you could stay overnight. So this house was called Tree Lawn. So we had Tree Lawn here and Rose Lawn just down the street for where they slept. So Tree Lawn and Rose Lawn. So now Maud loved Muskoka. She loved Bala. And while she was here, she said in her diary, I can dream again. And she started to write in her diary after having a dream actually one night, an outline for a whole book. And that book turned into The Blue Castle. Now The Blue Castle is an adult love story set in Muskoka. So all her books to this time were set in Prince Edward Island and they were all for children. But Maud was unhappy with her books being uh, set in the children's part of library. So she said, I'll show them. I'll do an adult novel and they'll have to start putting this book at least in the adult section of libraries. So, Ontario, Muskoka, this is the one and only book of 22 books that's not set in Prince Edward Island. And we thought this was important enough to save this house from demolition and honor Lucy Maud Montgomery. Our heritage property uh, little plaque that we got a number of years ago. And so we're the second building in Bala to be designated as a heritage property. The first is a stone church in the middle of the town by the waterfalls. And we had to decide what we were going to say here. But it was known as Tree Lawn Tourist Home in 1909, so that's what we decided. We, we decided not to say Bala's Museum because Bala's Museum won't go on forever. But the heritage of this house will. So that's the lovely thing about heritage properties, that um, it's the law that they must keep standing. And um, our heritage thing says we have to keep the same, they call it an envelope, the same uh, siding on the house, um, same shape windows, and we've also has our, have our newel post on our staircase designated, and our other door, which is the front door, because we're at the side door, the other door is designated as well because it has two keyholes for skeleton keys, one for the guests to open the door and, and a second one for the owners to lock the door at night so if anybody was late coming home and past the if they had a curfew or something, they're not going to get back into the house. This is the first room I started with when we were restoring 
this house to be a museum. So it was uh, 30 years ago and I had sort of an idea of what I wanted in the kitchen but my idea got changed. But first of all I had to deal with a very awful kitchen. With, it had a built-in oven but it was just sitting on the counter so you could see its rough sides so it wasn't built in at all and we had to get it was propane we had to get rid of that and the propane stove and cut off the propane lines and then we were offered a chance to look at some windows because these windows were missing we, they were only half windows and this window was missing completely so um, the man that was selling doors and windows to me said oh you might be interested in something else I have I have an old stove and it works so the colors cream and green and all of a sudden I knew I was doing a cream and green 1920s kitchen because this is cream and green. And I had been thinking about cream and green because I had my grandmother's, this is called jadeware, it's basically glass, or sort of like Pyrex almost. Uh, so I had her cup and saucer and I, I thought it was kind of ugly but when I saw it in a kitchen that was cream and green, all of a sudden it comes to life and I realize it really is quite gorgeous jadeware. So the stove works, and there's even a, a wire. If you look behind it, uh, I call it a sign leg. <laughs> On the right, there's a wire, so we have it wired up and it works. And I've had to figure out how this kind of stove works because all I have are these knobs. This one says top oven. This one says bottom oven, which is a warming oven. So top oven, you could turn it to low, medium or high. So just in my trying to figure this out, if I wanted to preheat the oven to do some baking or roasting, I would turn it to high. And there's a thermometer, so maybe you'd like to come a little closer and see the thermometer. There's a thermometer here on the side, and once you get this going, it will start going up. So if you were going to bake something, let's say at 350 degrees, it will finally get up to 350, but then you have to keep it at that temperature. So that's probably the time you turn it down from high, which is there, down to medium. And then if it continued to get too hot and you didn't want to burn what you're baking, you would have to turn it down to low. Or if it got too cool, you might have to turn it back up to medium. So, so it's a lot of work to work with a stove like this, but, not as much work as a wood stove would have been because your, your oven thermometer might say you needed to add some more wood to make it hotter. So you'd be adding wood or dampering it down to make it cooler or things like that. So, so that's the era of the kind of baking we had in this space. And as you, you probably saw, this is the name of the fridge. So we don't really think too much of the name sometimes, but if you think of frigid air, very cold air, this is a wonderful name for a fridge. In fact, it was such a wonderful name that when we say to somebody, go get the butter from the fridge, we're actually saying, go get the butter from the frigid air. Because all other appliances that did the same thing, kept food cool, were refrigerators but this is the only one that was a fridge. So we've used that name. So let's see what it looks like inside. Here we are. So this is a 1925 fridge. It's a very special fridge because we've won a contest with this fridge as Canada's oldest working Frigidaire. And we suspect that we are the oldest in North America and it still works. Now we don't have it plugged in today because it's, it takes a ton of hydro and it's very, very noisy, it's motor. But uh, a fridge in 1925 was very liberating from a wo for a woman because they didn't have to have ice brought in or go pick up ice for an ice box then, and then that ice block of ice would continually melt, melt, melt. And so there'd be a little rubber almost hose in the fridge that would take that melted water down 
to underneath the fridge so you could, it would say it stay in a little sort of drip pan but once that filled up it would start filling up your floor so if you went away for a couple days you know, on in hot weather you might come back to a lake in your kitchen but a fridge meant you could actually go away on a holiday so oh and some husbands would drill a hole in the floor near where that little rubber hose was and put an extension of that hose right into the cellar. The cellar always was a dirt basement and that water would just get absorbed in the basement. So that's how some people dealt with the water issue of the ice melting. So here we have this beautiful 1925 fridge and it's as you know almost a hundred years old and it was life-saving for women. You could keep eggs in the fridge. And this is a very, very old egg carton in that beautiful shade of green. This is a very rare Bala milk bottle. And um, our milk bottles were shaped more like, um, like bowling pins almost <laughs> than some milk bottles. And the, and the, the dairy that did it, Grasmere Dairy, was right here on the Moon River, and they delivered milk by rowboat. So they'd hire a kid to row cases of milk in his rowboat, and he'd go from dock to dock, and if there was an empty milk bottle there, he would leave a full one. They probably had a little ticket or, or some money in that milk bottle for him. But somewhere along the line, one milk bottle was dropped into the river, this one didn't break, must have landed in the sandy part, and skin divers found it many, many, many decades later and donated it to our museum. So, so that's uh, the cold part of the fridge. This is the coldest. This is the freezer, but it's a very unusual freezer. It has three drawers, which are really ice cube trays. And if you look at the size of these cubes, they are actually cubes, three-dimensional squares. And all my life I've been calling them ice cubes, but I've been making in my refrigerator, in my fridge, and they're actually rectangles. So now I know what a cube is supposed to look like. And the way you got these out was to put them under a tap have water going across here and then give it a good bang and some of them would come out for you. So you'd only need one, one cube per glass size of this. But jello was becoming very popular. So um, you could make your jello with, with an ice cube in the water and it would gel very quickly. So three ice cube trays and there's no space for frozen food because frozen food hasn't been invented. Frozen food didn't come along for almost 30 years, early 1950s, when a man named Mr. Birdseye said, well, I've, I've created a, a generator to make cold air, and he applied it to a box car, in a, in a train of course, and he could send frozen food to, the, to market. But that meant, getting the, the frozen food to market, you had to have stores that had freezers in them. But more importantly, you needed homes that had freezers. So that's when refrigerators changed in the top part, the whole top section of the fridge in the 1950s would be a little freezer. And then eventually people got home freezers, starting with little ones about this big and then big chest freezers. So, and the first frozen food were things like frozen peas and vegetables, and then frozen uh, TV dinners came along. So I'm old enough that I can remember them. And TV tables, <laughs> TV dinner tables. So we were wondering what the price of a fridge from 1925. So I found this ad in a magazine from 1925. It's the identical fridge except it only has two ice cube trays. And look how much it costs. $245. Now I had an idea that that might be quite expensive 
So I asked my friend who has a Model T from 1925, so I said, okay, how much did a car cost then? And he said, $499. So half the price of what a fridge would cost. I mean, a fridge was half the price of a car. That's better. So can you imagine if, if that was still true today, that the lowest price fridge you might find would be maybe $15,000, and then it would go right up. A Tesla fridge might be $75,000. <laughs> So, so that's our, our prize winning fridge. So we won a, a brand new 2000, year 2000 millennial fridge that year. And it was so huge we couldn't fit it into our house. <laughs> so we, we gave it away to a very deserving family who had many children and they delivered it to, the, to them. They just moved to Barry's Bay. So they delivered it all the way from Toronto up to Barry's Bay. And that, that's, that was their prize. So, oh, and I was on television. So later, if you ask me for my autograph, I'll give it to you. So I'm, I'm just putting on my apron to tell you what my favorite story is in, in the kitchen. And uh, this is a cream and green apron, and I found it at a church bazaar. And I thought, wow, that's got my name written all over it. It's meant to be in this kitchen. So I bought it. So my favorite story in this kitchen and a, a really wonderful way to introduce families to Anna Green Gables because you can't assume that everyone in the family knows the story. Quite often the father might not or the boyfriend might not or a little kid might not have heard of it yet or, or seen a movie or anything. So we, we go through the, the story about this red haired freckled girl with a very bad temper to match her hair, but the most wonderful imagination. And after the Cuthbert family, Marilla and Matthew, get over the fact that they got a girl instead of a boy to help on the farm, they decide to keep Anne and begin this experiment of raising a child. And if it had been a boy, that would have been a wonderful thing because this orphan boy would have learned to be a farmer and eventually he would inherit Green Gables so what could be better than that and and then of course Anne is growing up and going to go her own way but she finds this this house of love for her and one of the first things Marilla says to her is I want you to learn to do what you're told and not use that imagination so much so when she had asked Anne to go up to the hen house to collect eggs, and that would be a new experience for Anne. So she's collecting eggs. These are my, um, I call them my everlasting eggs. They're actually porcelain, so I'm very careful about what children hold on to it. And uh, if we have little ones that need to hold an egg, I have wooden ones for them. So we pretend we've collected these eggs, and there's so much that Marilla teaches Anne how to make a custard. And I also find out many children don't know what a custard is. So a custard is sort of like vanilla pudding. Sometimes you can even find custard in a, a, a Danish or in the middle of a donut or something like that. So, Marilla gets busy cracking this egg, I'm using our imaginations of course, and uh, she does several to get this custard going. Oh, we better use a brown egg, I guess. Here we are. Okay, so we've got all these beautiful eggs in here. And then we'll add a little bit of sugar and some farm fresh milk to the mixture. And a lucky child gets to get a piece of nutmeg and grate it on the grater. This grows in the spice islands. And then we put a pinch of nutmeg in the custard. And Marilla beats it up with her egg beater. Notice mine is cream and green. So this, this egg beater actually says it's patented in 1920, so it's 100 years old. So, so after the custard is concocted, we pretend to bake it in the oven. And it doesn't take very long before the custard is ready. We set the timer and it seems like no time at all. The custard is ready. So we're using cream and green pot holders, we get that custard out of the oven and carefully bring it over to the kitchen table. 
where it cools. And then Anne is asked to take it to the pantry and make sure she covers it. So she dutifully carries it to the pantry, but forgets to cover it. Now the mouse that lived in the pantry, as soon as Anne was gone, he was pretty excited. He came out, here he is, and he climbs up the bowl and into the custard and starts swimming and eating. And he thinks it's just like dying and gone to heaven, which is sort of like foreshadowing. And then, when his tummy is full, he tries to climb out of the bowl and falls down. He does that several times, he can't quite get there. And on the third attempt, he falls back into the custard and drowns. So this is the scene that Anne finds, a dead mouse in the custard. And her first thought is that the mouse being in the custard is not what Marilla had told her. She said to cover it so Marilla might send her back to that orphanage. Anne takes action. She gets that mouse out of the custard, gets some of that custard off him, throws him away, and then she covers the custard with what she should have used in the first place, which is cheesecloth. Now cheesecloth is used in the production of cheese, but it's also very good for covering food, and you can tie it around the bowl to keep out bugs and uh, even mice. So she thought that was fine, Marilla would never know, but when company comes, the next thing she hears is Marilla saying, Anne, bring that custard in that we baked this morning. So Anne, with a pounding heart, does that, presents it to Marilla in the dining room and watches in horror as she starts to dish up bowls of custard for each of the guests. Now, the guests are saved from eating the custard by a rule of etiquette, etiquette meaning good manners. And the rule was that no one ate before the hostess, before Marilla started to eat. So Anne saw Marilla's spoonful of most, of most custard getting very close to her lips and yelled, Stop! Don't eat it! There was a dead mouse in it! And then she waited. Was Marilla going to be so angry that she would send back Anne back to the orphanage? Well, Marilla gave it a little bit of a thought and then she decided that it was an honest mistake and that Anne would be forgiven and allowed to stay at Green Gables as long as she always did what she was told and always covered the custard. Okay, as part of our display that we fondly call Anne, Madly Off in All Directions, it's a, it's, it's a storybook that has sort of gone ballistic, has gone into plays, movies, musicals, souvenirs, dolls, so in this room we have what I think is maybe the crowning piece of our collection and that is the world's largest Green Gables dollhouse. And I found this uh, dollhouse one day when I was trolling through eBay and I saw this dollhouse for sale but it looked like it might be sold. So I actually searched online and found the, the company that was selling it. It was a sort of a yard sale antique place in Orangeville and I phoned them and asked them if I could buy the dollhouse from them and uh, they said well I'm very very sorry it's been sold to a couple in Michigan and I said oh well that's too bad because uh, it's really a, a Canadian story and it's going to go to some Americans so they were just sort of holding the dollhouse until the Americans came to pick it up and it's going to be sold to some Americans who might show it to a few of their friends if they're dollhouse collectors. But it should be in a Canadian museum where thousands of people will see it. And they agreed with me. And not only that, they brought the price down for me. So we went to pick it up on April Fool's Day. And we, I should have known better because we went through two blizzards. And by the time we got to Orangeville, uh, we were pretty tired, but we managed to get fit this house in the SUV that we had uh, borrowed. And when we got back to Bala, the man who owned the SUV helped Jack carry up these, the stairs where people come in our entrance and into the hall and, and turned it. And then 
tried to get it in this room and discovered the house was one inch wider than the door frame. And, and, and well, it was April Fool's Day, and I, I should have caught them, but I had a cast on my foot at that time because I had a broken foot. So these two guys turned it on its end and tried to wiggle it in the room, causing quite a bit of damage to the house. And we actually still have a bit of damage with our roof line, but the house is here to stay because no one will ever get it out of this room again. So it's here for my lifetime and beyond. So having this house has been really great because I've been able to teach people what a gable was. I find that 90% of the people who come to Bala and have read Anna Green Gables or seen the movie don't know that this is a gable. So it's an architectural feature of the roof, big slope. And you'll notice it, we've got a little red here then in the window here. And they've painted the extra part of the gable green. So the house is called Green Gables. So she's Anne of Green Gables. So Anne who lives at Green Gables is really what Maud was saying when she wrote this story. So if you have a room where the walls are just coming up like this, and then the ceiling starts to slope, that's a gabled room. So this is the east gable. This is the, the gable that Anne cried herself to sleep that first night. This is the west gable. And this is the north gable. Oh, and here's a little gabled window in the attic. So when we bought the house, it had wallpaper and some other things in it that I had to repair a bit. And then it needed furniture. So it took me two years of searching for furniture to furnish the dollhouse. Because you have to have period furniture. It has to look as if it was sort of the things that were there when this fictional family and Matthew and Marilla lived there. So maybe we could go around behind and I'll show you some of the special things in the rooms. So you'll see on the back wall we have a wood stove, you see that it's the wood stove pipes go up right through the ceiling and then right up through the roof. And that's the way rooms were heated. And Marilla's at that wood stove, she's got her teapot ready and she's making tea for Matthew who's been hard at work outside cutting wood. In front of Marilla we have the kitchen table which is set for two people to have tea and the little, I love the dishes on that table. I bought them online from a seller in England and they're 100 year old dishes from a little girl's dollhouse in England, 100 years ago. And another fun thing is to find the mouse in the kitchen. Can you see him? He's near the food, the apples, the bas baskets of apples and potatoes. And he's been a very fortunate mouse up to now. He hasn't come in contact with custard or a mouse trap. So I had fun doing this room. And then set up a little area where she does her baking. So she's getting ready to make apple pie right here. Lucky Matthew. The room above the kitchen is the attic. And that's where you store things that you're not using all the time. So if you look at the little white chair against the wall there, you might see a Christmas wreath. So every December, I get that Christmas wreath out and I stick it on the front door of Green Gables. We're ready for Christmas. So there's some of the things that aren't needed. So to the right of the kitchen and downstairs is Matthew's room. Matthew has a heart condition, so his bedroom is always on the first floor. And later when he goes up to talk to Anne to ask her to apologize to Mrs. Lind, he goes upstairs for the first time in probably decades, because he never goes upstairs to Anne's room. So that's how we know Matthew's room is downstairs. So we have a few things that make it a farmer's room. One of the things I did is I made a little, um, some artwork on the wall here. And that's a very famous 
old etching of the sower. And so it's a farmer sowing seeds the old fashioned way, just by hand, broadcasting them by hand. And I think you can see in his room too, past his little washstand, his pipe and things. So Marilla never really liked him smoking in the house, but Matthew was uh, a smoker. Above Matthew's room, we have the sewing room. And you, there's an old spinning wheel. He had actually some balls of wool near it. And right here is a frame for making, for well, when they're sewing a quilt. So they would have that section out and would do their hand stitching, uh, whatever design they're doing, right there. And, and two chairs so that two women could work at the quilt together. Moving one over. Down below here we have the dining room. And I was really thrilled to find this dining room table and chairs. They're actually dollhouse furniture from about 1930. So they're kind of going to be 100 years old soon. And I had seen it on eBay and it was almost as much as a real wooden dining room table and chairs. And I just, I knew the name of it, the company that made it, and I just kept searching and searching. Finally, I found it again, but it was all dusty, watermarked and things. And I took a chance, I bought it for about a third of the price the other table was. And I, I just put lemon oil on it and it came up beautifully. So that's, that's the story behind the dining room table. And past the dining room through the beautiful French doors is the parlor. Now the parlor was a very special, well, it was even more than a living room. It was a special room that was always kept clean, dusted, um, the rugs shaken out. They didn't have vacuum cleaners yet. So it was always ready for company, like special company, like the minister coming for a visit or the school teacher. So that's the room you'd entertain them in. Not your kitchen. You went to the special room. Above both those rooms here, we have some more bedrooms. We have Marilla's room right here. And I don't know if you noticed, but under her bed and under Matthew's bed are chamber pots. So I had new Canadians in last week, and they were very surprised to know that Canada in that time did not have bathrooms, that they had outhouses. They just thought Canada was this privileged country that always had bathrooms. <laughs> so this was news to them to find out what a chamber pot was. And through the doorway from Merla's room, across the hall, is the guest room, and, or the spare bedroom. And that was Anne's biggest desire, it was on her bucket list, to sleep in a spare bedroom. And of course, that doesn't happen for a while until she's at Diana's house, and of course, um, there's some almost tragic results with jumping on the bed there. And I needed some um, some decoration for this room so I found a cross stitch of the famous hymn Great is Thy Faithfulness. So it's above the washstand in Marilla's room. So I, well thank goodness for color printers and, and computers able to bring things down in size, so I downsized it and I put a little frame around it and we have what looks like a cross-stitched, very special uh, picture on the wall. On the dresser, if you go up a little bit higher, you'll see on the dresser an amethyst brooch that belongs to Marilla. So it hasn't been caught in a shawl yet. This is a very, very special case that contains two books. The one on the left is chocolate brown colored and the picture, ha it's, this book has been so well loved the picture is almost completely rubbed off and the spine and things are are quite bad shape. Now I saw this book on eBay and I think my radar was out because I was thinking whoa, whoa, whoa. there's something about that book that's very special and I don't know why I thought that. It was only, the lady selling it was only asking $10 for it. Oh wow. So I wrote the lady through eBay 
and asked her what it said on the publishing page. So she got back to me. She said, it says June 1908, first edition, first impression. And I nearly fainted. Because a first edition, first impression, if it's in good shape, can sell up to $45,000 American. So, and I knew we never would ever have a budget that I could buy a $45,000 book to say, oh, look at me, I have a first edition, first impression. <laughs> but it meant I had to bid long and hard for this book when it came due. And unfortunately, when she wrote me, other people could read her answer. They could read my question and read the answer. So other people were interested in it too. So I paid just over $100 for it. And I was so amazed that this book was chocolate brown. The Lucy Maud Montgomery scholars had always said that there were two colors to the first edition books. One the sort of, um, they call this a teal blue. They call it sort of a bluey green, teal blue, or beige. And then this book comes along and they say, oh, there must have been three. There's a chocolate brown one. And I've seen one other chocolate brown since then. So I know of two in existence. So when Lucy Mom Montgomery wrote the story, Anna Green Gables, she sent it to publisher after publisher after publisher, and they all rejected her. Nobody liked this book. Nobody had ever heard of this L.M. Montgomery in P.E.I. And she sent it to um, publishing companies on the eastern seaboard. Because when you live in Prince Edward Island, you're very close to Boston and New York. But Montreal and Toronto are a long, long way away. So she was more familiar with those publishers. So finally she sends it to a guy in Boston. His name is Lewis C. Page. The Page is a really good name for a publisher. So Mr. L.C. Page finally said he would publish it, but he didn't think it was going to go anywhere. He had no idea it was going to be the Harry Potter of 1908, that people would be lining up to buy this book, that it would go into printing after printing after printing. They couldn't keep it in stock. But when he first publishes, publishes it in 1908 of June, um, he said, okay, this is, would be a good time to use up all my, my spare um, colors of fabric for, for the cover and bindings. So I can use up this teal blue, I can use up some beige, obviously some chocolate brown got in there. So he just, he didn't care. He also stole the picture from a magazine cover and never paid the artist. So, but he didn't think anybody would notice this book. So it's published in June, guess what? In July, they have to do a reprint. Guess what? In um, August, they do another reprint. In September, another. In October, another. It goes into nine reprints before Christmas, from June to Christmas. And then, starting in March, it goes into about 10 more reprints the next year. So it has become world famous. Already, someone in Sweden is translating this book into Swedish in 1909. So the book's only a year old, and they start studying it in school. Two years later, someone in Poland starts translating it. So, um, so in 1911, the Polish people have Anya of the Little Green Hills. They don't know what a Green Gables is, you see. But, and then they, they start then to study it in school. So it's gone all around the world, and most countries, because we get people from all around the world coming, most company or most countries study it in school, except for our own country. There you are. Another aspect of Green Gables is that Lucy Ma Montgomery visited this house many times. It was just a, a short walk away from, from where she lived with her grandparents who were raising her. And she loved this house. And she always said, that if she ever wrote a novel, she was going to set the novel in and around this house. And she kept her word. And she called it Anne of Green Gables. 
Now in 1908, when the book is published, all of a sudden tourists are flocking to Cavendish looking for this farmhouse known as Green Gables. And for years and years, Maud's cousins who lived here put up with all these people sort of walking around their house or peeking in here, peeking in there. And, and finally the government got an idea. They thought, we should really buy this whole farm and turn it into a national park. So in 1936, they bought the house, all the fields around it, and the barn. And the first thing they did, and then they must have regretted it, was tear the barn down. Then they turned the fields into a golf course. And there was another big regret then, because the ninth hole of the golf course was slight, just down a slope from this section of the house, which is the parlor. And one day somebody was golfing there, some, some guy, and hit the ball not too well, and it went right through one of the antique windows inside, hitting the, the guide or the interpreter and breaking their wrist. And I'm not sure if it was a male or female, but it was a broken wrist. Then they had one more broken window and they thought, okay, all right, we have to change the design of this golf course. So, so they've got this house and they've got to make it look like Anne, Marilla, and Matthew lived there. So they had to do all the things to make it correspond to what was in this fictional book. So the mother and children, they can go see this historic house that has to do with the story Anne of Green Gables, and the men and boys go golfing. So there you have it.